In the last episode, we were left with some pretty important questions. How does the Game Boy generate sound and graphics? How does it know what buttons we're pressing? We know that the Game Boy has a picture processing unit and an audio processing unit, but before we can answer these questions in detail, there is one more important question that needs to be asked. How does the CPU even talk to them? Modern computers have USB ports, PCI Express ports, SATA ports, but there is nothing of the sort in the Game Boy. How do all the parts talk to each other? Well, there is one important detail from the previous episode that should give us a clue. Let's watch this clip for a second. In more relatable terms, the Game Boy can handle 64 kilobytes of memory. Hmm, but a little bit earlier we said... The CPU, 8 kilobytes of work RAM, 8 kilobytes of video RAM, and the cartridge slot. 8 kilobytes of work RAM plus 8 kilobytes of video RAM means 16 kilobytes of total memory. What's going on here? Where are the other 48 kilobytes? Well, the answer is that while the Game Boy's 16-bit address space allows us to handle 65,536 memory positions, not all of that is actual memory. The Game Boy uses a technique called Memory Mapped Input-Output to talk to its various components, which means that they appear to the CPU as if they were memory. Let's visualize it to make it easier to understand. Imagine you worked in a room where the only way to talk to the outside world was a mailbox. You can put a letter for one of 65,536 addresses in it, and it can contain a new value for them or a request for a value. Now on the other side, you have a bunch of different people, each watching the letters passing by, looking for the ones addressed to their department. Some of the addresses actually correspond to the RAM, but not all of them do. Some go to the graphics system, some go to the cartridge, some go to the buttons, and so on. From your side, the CPU, you only need to be able to do two things. Write a number on a letter or read the number on the letter. You don't need to know how things work on the other side or even who is on the other side. You simply follow the instructions. This is the magic of memory mapping. Many devices use this technique, including modern computers. One of the reasons it was chosen for the Game Boy is that there is no need to implement special CPU operations to talk to the other devices. The same instructions that are used to load and modify a value in RAM can be used to communicate with other components, which reduces the complexity of the CPU. However, this also means that your devices eat up address space that could be used for actual RAM. This is part of the reason why most home-use 32-bit versions of Windows could only use up to about 3 gigabytes of RAM, even if 32 bits are enough to address 4 gigabytes. The rest of the address space was used by devices like the graphics card, with the top-of-the-line models occupying as much as 1.8 gigabytes. There were ways to work around this limitation, but that's an entirely different and vast topic. So going back to our Game Boy, what did the memory map look like? A little announcement. All the addresses and positions in the rest of the video are mainly going to be shown in hexadecimal. If you know what hexadecimal is, please bear with me for just a minute. If you don't know what hexadecimal is, here's a super quick explanation. Hexadecimal is a counting system where after you reach 9, you keep counting using the letters A through F before moving to 10. This means that F equals 15, 10 equals 16, 1F equals 31, and so on. 65,535 in hexadecimal is FFFF. So the Game Boy's memory address space goes from 0 to FFFF. So here are the 64 kilobytes of address space. Let's look at the general layout proceeding from address 0 upwards. The first thing we encounter in the memory map is the cartridge itself. Reading addresses from 0000 through 7FFF asks the cartridge to return whatever data is stored on its memory chip. The following area is the graphics RAM, or video RAM, which holds patterns, called tiles, that are used like building blocks to construct the graphics on screen. It also contains data that tells the Game Boy how to compose those tiles into a background layer for the game. This part of the memory map points to what is called external RAM. In the wild, this was often part of the cartridge and would store the game saves. Here is the actual work RAM. This is the address range where we find the Game Boy's internal 8 kilobytes of RAM. This range is weird. Due to internal quirks on the original Game Boy, it contains an identical copy of the work RAM. Nintendo officially declares usage of this area as prohibited. But if you write something at address E000, it appears at C000 also, and the same goes for the opposite. 
However, this strange shadow area is not exactly the same size as the work ramp, because the last 512 bytes have another function and are where a lot of the magic happens. This small area is called OAM, or Sprite Attribute Table, and contains data telling the Game Boy which tiles to use to construct moving objects on the screen, called sprites. These 127 bytes are extremely interesting. They're used to talk directly to devices like the screen controller, the sound generator, the buttons, the link cable, and the internal timers. Some specific addresses are read by the devices and used as parameters, for example, to know which note to play, while other addresses are written to by the devices for the game to read, like the state of the buttons. This is a teeny tiny area of RAM that is right inside the CPU and is very fast. It can be used for whatever purpose the developers want. The very last byte is used to turn the interrupt system on or off. Interrupts are special signals that are triggered for some important events and can, as the name implies, interrupt the normal execution of the game's code to satisfy a particular immediate need. We'll talk some more about them when we tackle the graphics system. Now let's see how getting the state of the buttons works as an example. Their functionality is entirely managed using address FF00. Bits 6 and 7 are never used and always read as 0, even if you write a 1 in them. Bits 4 and 5 are normally set to 1. Setting them to 0 will make the remaining 4 bits assume a specific value depending on which buttons are pressed. Specifically, when bit 5 is set to 0, bits 0, 1, 2, and 3 will change to represent the status of right, left, up, and down on the D-pad with a zero meaning pressed and one meaning not pressed. If bit four is set to zero, they will represent A, B, select and start. Let's look at some actual code from the Ms. Pac-Man game to see how it handled getting button data. First of all, we put the number 32 in register A, then copy it into the button register. If you write 32 in binary, you can see that bit number five is set to one and bit number four is set to zero. So loading this value into address FF00 will tell the Game Boy to make bits 0, 1, 2, and 3 represent A, B, select, and start. After doing this, the game moves the result into register A two times. This is done because the transition from one state to the other can bounce between states for a little bit, which is why this operation is called debouncing. Let's pretend that A and B were being pressed. Now let's put the value into register A. We invert all the bits in register A to make it so that 1 means pressed and 0 means not pressed, which makes more logical sense. The game then performs an AND operation between the contents of register A and the value 0F, putting the result in A. The AND operation compares each of the respective bits of the operands, and for each couple, like the name implies, returns 1 if both the first AND the second bit being compared are 1, otherwise it returns 0. So in this case, 0 and 0 is 0, 0 and 1 is 0, 1 and 0 is 0, and 1 and 1 is 1. If you look at what happened, we basically made it so that only values from the rightmost four bits were preserved, and all the other ones were set to 0. This is called masking and is a very useful property of the AND operation. After doing this, the game uses the swap instruction, which simply swaps the higher four bits with the lower four. Then the contents of register A are copied into register B so that we're free to use register A for something else. This time we load 16 into register A, which has bit 4 set to 1 and bit 5 set to 0. When we load it into address FF00, we're asking for the status of the D-pad buttons. The game then reads the contents a bunch of times, once again to account for a bit of bouncing due to having switched the set of buttons to check. Let's pretend that up and left were pressed. Like before, we invert all the bits and keep only the lower four. This time, however, we also perform an OR operation between register B, which contains our old data for the buttons, and register A. The OR operation returns one when either the first or the second or both the bits are one. Zero or zero is zero, zero or one is one, one or zero is one, and one or one is one. As you can see, we basically merge the two values into one, and the final result is that we have an 8-bit number where each bit directly represents whether one of the buttons is pressed or not. 
The game then performs some additional logic to check if the input changed from the previous time it was checked, and so on. But this is the bulk of the whole process. The video and sound system work in a very similar way, although both are interesting in their own right and deserve a full episode each. Now you'd think that this would end the mysteries about memory sizes, but there is one more strange thing that we should hint at before concluding this episode. Look at the amount of space that corresponds to the cartridge. We have from address 0 to address 7 FFF 32,768 bytes, or 32 kilobytes. Now, let's take the ROM for Tetris. This file contains a one-to-one -one copy of the contents of the cartridge. Look at this, exactly 32 kilobytes of data, a perfect fit. But now look at the ROM for another game, Pokemon Crystal. It's two megabytes. In fact, the number of games that are actually exactly 32 kilobytes in size is extremely small. Even the teeny tiny first Super Mario Land game was 64 kilobytes. How is this possible? The trick is extremely interesting and shows how game cartridges offered a kind of versatility and opportunity for creativity that has yet to be matched by modern game media. We'll find out all about it in the next episode. Until then, thanks for watching.